Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this another session of comprehensive course of echocardiography, the 47th one right now going on. And today we have with us none other than Dr. Colonel S.K. Parashar to talk about valvular stenotic lesion, that's mitral and aortic stenosis. As all of us know, Dr. Parashar has been the past president of Cardiological Society of India, Indian Academy of Echocardiography, apart from being a leading non-invasive cardiologist in India and internationally. He's renowned as, he's known as the father of echocardiography in India. And he is the one who created Indian Academy of Echocardiography in India. With this few words, let me hand over my mic to Colonel Ashley Prashir, sir, to start oh. on mitral stenosis. Sir, it's all yours. You can share your slides, sir. Perfect, sir. They are on. They are seen now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Actually, I think it is a basic course is on mitral and tricuspid stenosis, not aortic stenosis. Mitral and tricuspid stenosis. Are not yeah. True, sir. So we start with some revision slide which you learned last time. So as we told you that always combine the 2D Doppler data to assess severity. The sequence should always be 2D echo first to get the anatomical information. Color flow mapping to guide you parallel to the blood flow. That is how you get the maximum taste. Try to get maximum velocities because as you know, the velocities are converted into gradients. If your velocity is wrong, everything is wrong. So that's why take the, we take multiple span, scan planes to record the velocity. Never give a diagnosis on one imaging plane and use always multiple parameters. So never once, for example, we told you that tricuspid regurgitation is seen from five planes or so. So that is the thing. Use all planes and not single. See for intercurrent alneas because these affect your doctor finding cases like anemia, hypertension, thyroid toxicity. If you find these patients, you must mention that the echo should be repeated when these intercurrent alneas. So for example, patient coming 103 fever, you refuse an echo. When the fever comes down, then you do it. Severe anemia, let it so because they all affect your Doppler findings or so. And as we told you, average about three beats for a sinus rhythm and five there, and always have an ECG and scan, scan all walls. So this was already told to you, but you have to see this always that how these are parameters important. For example, we have you told you the ECG. Now you, you this is the end diastole. And you, this is, this is the systole. The systole starts from end to the end of the T wave. And you see there is systole. So there is a thickening of the various segments of the LV or RV because it is known as a normal systolic thickening. And after this start, the diastole. So remember this from the QRS to the end of the T wave is systole. And this is diastole. All these are, all these are characterized by this. You go from aorta, mitral ball, and all this thing. So this is a, Sort of give you an idea, this slide that what do you see in diastole and systole. Then as I told you that clinical information is very important. Now we don't jump straight to the echo. Have a good anatomic information and a good hemodynamic information because they are key to your diagnosis and severity. Now, so that is why we always record, Doppler records velocity. That is why we are always parallel to the flow because the velocities give rise to the hemodynamics and that is why you see they, they are converted into gradients. So if your four into 64 becomes 64, so if your velocities are wrong, your gradients will be wrong and your calculation will be wrong. So always use multiple scan planes and try to be as parallel to the blood flow as possible before you come to the a conclusion. And this is what you told, as we told you that when you planimeter any ball, any Doppler, you get a peak and mean gradient and the VTI. So that is the, this was only told to you, this is a quick revision. Now remember, this is the most practically used sentence in the whole of your course. Any chamber subjected to prolonged pressure or volume overload increases in size. Suppose there is a pulmonary hypertension, the RV is subjected to an increased 
pressure overload and after period time it increases in size so and so that means it is always a any chamber always increase size this you will see repeatedly in your course 2d echo always gives a semi quantitative idea of severity so never ignore a 2d echo that will give you a semi quantitative idea and this you see this will hold true in many of the situations where you work so the role of echo in a vascular heart disease is that is vascular heart disease present suppose there is a diastolic murmur there is systolic murmur whether it is because of this any valvular lesion or so if vascular heart disease is present any what is the severity severity criteria will be told to you of all the diseases any other valvular involvement so that is why we say always scan multiple valves never get set five we only seeing one one valve and you can other you can miss other valve cardiac functions are important any the ejection fraction which can be normal for a normal person may be reduced for a patient of a mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis any complications any hemodynamic effects like pulmonary hypertension requirement of intervention or type of intervention echo will tell you whether for example mitral stenosis whether you require a balloon dilatation or you require a valve replacement and then the type follow up also so all these will view a, a they are the role of echo in all these situations and all of them play an important part for example then the basic evaluation we told you in the valvular heart disease as we told you 2d echo first you start give you the anatomic information what is the chamber size what is the thickness of the wall any calcification any pericardial fusion then a functional information by ejection fraction or so after 2d you come to the color flow mapping which direct the visualization of the blood flow and guides parallel to the flow so that you have this with this sequence and doppler is the a quantitative a peak gradient is usually for more common in aortic wall lesions and pulmonary wall lesions but usually less important in other situations also because it is affected by various factors so here we see a calculation of a valvular wall area is the most important and the gradients what are the gradients across the of the wall of what is this and the calculation of the area and as you say be completely parallel to the flow so that is why these are the three important features also that you have to go in the step wise in these situations so the aims of the aims of the mitral stenosis are these are some will will go one by one because this is the commonest wall lesion will you you will see we'll try to go into some more details here. once you, you have confirmed the lesion by a by a might by an echo that yes this lesion is present mitral stenosis is present then pathophysiology if you can understand the pathophysiology you can understand many of the factors also now if you come to the pathophysiology remember as we told you and you should not forget mitral wall opens in diastole i hope you have not forgotten in the last one week so when the mitral wall opens in diastole it allows the blood to flow from la to left ventricle the the mitral wall is between the la to left ventricle and when it opens in diastole the blood flow now blood flow is maintained as long as lv pressure is lower than the la pressure the blood always flows from a higher pressure to a lower pressure so so when the when the blood is going from the la to lv la is at a higher pressure at lv when the lv fills up the both the pressures almost become normal so what i'm saying mitral stenosis there is an obstruction of the flow from la to lv so so because the mitral wall is situated between la and lv when there is an obstruction the lv has to increase its pressure to push the blood through a narrowed orifice the example i gave you last time that if you have to push a man of 50 kg you require a certain pressure if you are to pull push a man of 90 kg you require more pressure because you are going against an increased resistance so the same thing is here when there is an increased resistance to flow through the narrow orifice the la pressure should increase so when the la pressure is increased what are the consequences when the la pressure is more don't get worried by the next slide it is very simple when we explain to you in mitral stenosis as i told you there is an increase in the la pressure correct there is a because increase in the la pressure because there is a 
there is the obstruction to the wall. When the LA pressure is increased, it leads to a LA remodeling. Remodeling means any change in size, function also. As I told you, any, any chamber which is subjected to increased pressure increases in size. So because of, an, because of stenosis, a persistent increase, there's an increase in size of the LA. You see the LA size increases because it has, again, the same principle as I told you, any chamber subjected to increase pressure volume increases in size. So when the LA increases in size, ultimately leads to atrial fibrillation and LA clot at the long stage or so. So the first thing you see is always the size of the LA or any other problem in the LA, and then you see the various any clots or so. Now, suppose I'll come to the later on. So, so up till now, there's an increase in the LA pressure, correct? So that is only one thing finishes, and the persistent increase in LA pressure can lead to atrial fibrillation. Now, when there's an increased LA pressure, they, 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 the same pressure is transmitted to the pulmonary veins because there is no wall between the LA and the pulmonary veins. So when there's an increased pressure in the LA, the same increased pressure goes into the pulmonary veins. As a result of it, from the pulmonary veins, it goes to the pulmonary arteries and produces a pulmonary artery hypertension. So this is the pathophysiology of persistent increase in the LA pressure drains causes increase in the pulmonary venous pressure, which is drains into the LA. Again, any chamber which is subjected to increased pressure increases in size. And this leads to a pulmonary artery hypertension because this is connected to this. So when there is a pulmonary artery hypertension, the RV dilates and then it can fail also. So it can produce an RVH. So that by now you see, you have to see for LA, you have to see for LA pressure, you have to see for pulmonary artery pressure, you have to see for the RVH, you have to see for RV dilatation because here, when there is an increased pulmonary artery hypertension, so as RV has to work over time more forcibly, so when the RV has to push against an increased pressure, it leads to RVH. For example, you've seen aortic stenosis. With the, when the aortic stenosis, the characteristic feature is LVH. Why? Because the LA, LV has to increase against an increased pressure. So same it leads to RVH. And because of a pressure overload, pressure overload means that RV is subjected to increased pressure of pulmonary vein it leads to RV dilatation also. So these are the basic pathophysiology. It is simple, though it may be quite difficult to understand. Now, so once we have seen that the, the, the mitral stenosis is present, the diagnosis used, the very important thing is always check for history, physical examination, chest the clay ECG. It can give you a significant information. Even in auscultation can give you a significant information. And echocardiography is the mainstay in evaluation. So now what this holds true for all valvular lesions. Now, whenever there is any valve disease, it automatically be becomes thick, fibrosis. These are the stages of the stenotic lesions. So because there is a disease of the valve, because of any process, it may initially lead to thickness, a further disease can lead to fibrosis and calcification. Sometimes the patients can come for directly to our calcification. So this is seen in all the cases of a stenotic lesion, that you see a thickness or a calcification. Then because that wall is diseased, so its opening is restricted. A normal wall opens fully, but now because the wall is diseased with fibrosis and calcification, there is a restricted opening. It doesn't open as much as, as it should open because of the disease. Then one of the most characteristic feature is doming of the cusp in the direction of the flow. Like this is the doming of the, of the blood, like this. Uh, it with the convexity towards the distal chamber. We'll show you, then you'll understand uh, very much. This is the common in every stenotic lesion. And you see, now you see this is the mitral ball. This is the left atrium. Aorta, right it, ventricle, left it. You see here, you see, the, it is like a reverse hockey stick. There is a doming with a convexity toward the left ventricle. This is LA, this is left ventricle. So this is known as the classical doming of the mitral leaflet. With, the, with this, uh, the convexity toward the distal chamber, a classical sign. Now here you see, this is the still image. Again, you see, right ventricle, left ventricle, aorta, aorta, LA, 
and you see here, this is the doming, like this. The doming is because the because the alveolus is fixed, and the tip of the mitral leaflet is the disease. So it is the body which moves. So it is a sign of mobility, and you see the posterior leaflet moves toward the anterior leaflet. I am only concerned about the doming. By this time, you should have known how a doming looks like. With this convexity into the LV. I hope it is clear. So this is now similarly, you see. This is you see. This is a mitral wall normal. This is an anterior mitral leaflet. This is a posterior mitral leaflet. And in systole, they close together and they move in the opposite direction. This moves anteriorly and the posterior leaflet moves posteriorly. But in a mitral stenosis, you see, they're fused together. So they move in the same direction as compared to this. They're moving in the opposite direction and there's good opening amplitude, good opening amplitude, but a disease wall, you see there's a restricted opening, there's a thickening and the paradoxical motion of the posterior cusp. All the things we have shown you in 2D, that there is a thickening of the cusp, you can see as compared to this, it is a fine, thin cusp. Here you see there is a thickening of the cusp, there is a restricted opening, and there is a paradoxical portion of posterior cusp which moves together with the anterior cusp. If you are asked one sign of one and more sign of a mitral stenosis, the one and more sign is a, a paradoxical motion of the posterior cusp in relation to the anterior cusp rather than moving posteriorly. So this is the pathology of this that because they are fused, so they, are, they move in the same direction. Again, you see thin cusp, good amplitude, not thickened, opposite direction, and you see thick cusp, move restricted opening and moving in the same direction posterior also. Now see the aortic, the aortic stenosis. Now this is the aortic wall. This is the zoomed view. This is the anterior mitral leaflet. This is septum. You see, there is a convexity towards the aorta. You see, this is a doming of the cusp. You see, in the, this comes like this. In systole, it comes like this. And it is a doming toward the, toward the aorta. And you see, this is still image, you see there's a doming of the cusp and we will have convexity toward the distal chamber, which is the aorta. So you see all this will show you the doming. To so always see, you must see some doming and how it looks like. We have shown you two, two still images. Now see, this is the pulmonary wall, you see. This is the pulmonary artery. This is the short axis view. This is the aorta. This is the left atrium. And this is the pulmonary artery and it shows a a convexity toward the distal chamber. See, it shows this convexity. And you see, this is a convexity toward the distal chamber. So in all the three cases we have shown you, there is a convexity and doming of the cusp towards the distal chamber. In mitral wall, it is what toward the left ventricle. In aortic wall, it was toward the aorta. In this pulmonary wall, because it is lying between the pulmonary artery and the right ventricle, the convexity is toward the or the pulmonary artery. And you see, this is the tricuspid stenosis. The large light atrium. And you see, this is the doming toward the restricted opening, restricted opening, thickening of the cusp, and with a, with a convexity toward the distal chamber, RV. And you can also see there is a calcification of the mitral cusp. That you show because the tricuspid stenosis is more costly. With the, it, involved with the aortic mitral stenosis. So just to show you doming, that back to your, you, you see all the four doming, which is a very classical sign of this, the this. Later on, any, any image you want to see again, you can let us know, but I think they're very clear, we showed you the thickening of the cusp, a restricted opening, and the doming toward the distal chamber. So as the wall narrows, the gradient increase, because increase gradient of high, the, the, as the ball goes on narrowing, the left atrial pressure goes on increasing to push the blood. So the gradient is the difference of pressure between the two chambers. So this is the reason that previous that as the as the ball goes on increase in narrowing in size, the left atrium has to increase its force, and for to increase its force, it has to increase its pressure to open the aortic mitral ball. That is why it increases like this. So, for the summary, you must have a clinical thickening of the cusp. 
you see thickening of the cusp, doming of the anterior mitral leaflet with a convexity towards the left ventricle, paradoxical motion of the posterior cusp towards the anterior restricted opening and chamber enlargement, LA enlarge, RV enlarge. So, so this is what you want to, so that suppose you want to always keep a note with you so that you may not forget, keep these five, six things noted in your small diary at mitral stenosis and when you see, when you keep it, you will not miss what you are going to see. Etiology, the commonest, remember for you, the commonest cause is rheumatic mitral stenosis, the most commonest cause. And this is characterized by a fusion of the commissures and that is why in a, a balloon well what will they split the commissures and when there is a multivalor involvement, it is more suggestive of a, of a rheumatic, of a rheumatic. So this is used to, this is the commissures. We'll come to the commissures later on. This is a short access view at the mitral wall level and see the commissures are fused and very narrowed. So you see it further also. So this we have already shown you. Another, it, another is what is the, another which we see is a de, that is more commonly seen in a Western countries. A degenerative mitral stenosis is more commonly seen, which is both because of the mitral annular calcification. They don't see rheumatic stenosis so much, and because of the increasing life expectancy of the patients, they get more of a degenerative mitral stenosis <laughs> as compared to rheumatic. And see, this is the mitral annulus calcification. The leaflets are always attached to the annulus, correct? No, they cannot be floating without an annulus. And see, the mite is the calcification. <laughs> In some cases, the calcification extends into the mitral leaflets. And when it extends into the mitral leaflet, it can produce a thickening and stenotic rise pictures. Uh, see, <laughs> this is mitral, this is mitral annular calcification. Restricted opening of the mitral leaflets. This is a turbulence, as we told you last time, a turbulence is always seen in a diseased wall, and you here will see the various gradients or so. So this is the more, and we see quite a bit of this. Whenever we see a patient of like 50 years, 60 years, we always write a degenerative mitral stenosis or a functional mitral stenosis. That is because they are patients of 60, 70 years of age, so they must not be having a mostly rheumatic. We rule of rheumatic, but degenerative is quite common. So for you, there are mainly two causes. Forget about the rest. So next week, after we have seen the etiology, you have confirmed the lesion, you know the pathophysiology, then you have to, once you have diagnosed, then you come to the severity. How to assess the severity of mitral stenosis? Now, there are three, two, as I told you, the aortic pressure, the aortic wall area is one of the correct methods to assess severity. So there are three ways, a 2D echo, itself, only a 2D echo of the mitral wall I'm talking of, then the 2D plane image of the wall area, and then the pressure half time. So you see here, you see, this mitral stenosis, you see there's a doming of the mitral leaflet. Toward this, there is a slight thickening, but a fairly good opening of the mitral wall. You can see fairly good opening of the mitral wall. And you can see, so you can see mild thickening at the apex and paradoxical motion of a good motion of the doming in meat indicates a good, good pliability. Now you see, I compared to this, now see, this is the, this now you see. Now here you see, there is a marked restriction of the mitral wall opening. It is more thickening. It is more thickened like a fibrous tissue. With specks of calcification, more of the LA is enlarged. You see, as compared to this, you see the LA is there, but you see there is a good opening and restriction movement. But here you see the LA is more enlarged. There is a very, there is this doming, but there is a very marked restriction of a of the of the leaflet. So we can and, and they hardly they open. So we can say this is a much more severe mitral stenosis. Only 2D echo we can say. In this in these patients, if you get a different mitral wall area, which is 
one point zero to one point nine. That means you are somewhere wrong in calculating. So two D algo gives you a semi quantitative idea, and you come to the cal to calcific. This is a calcific MS, like a chalk has been put on the mitral wall. This is this, and, and you see that doming is not marked. As I told you, doming is a sign of mobility. And the more the mobility of the wall, the better it is. Now you see here it is a very heavily calcified wall, very poor opening, and you see there is hardly any doming. But but this is a more of a calcium. So you have she is a mild, moderate, and severe aortic stenosis. That's how they look like only on an echo or so. Then we come to the. This is the most important thing, more difficult but most important, a measurement of 2D echo. Area. This is done in a short axis view. Remember, and the method will be shown to you sometime. And that it is you have to be at the tip of the leaflets and not at the base of the leaflet. At the shortest distance at the tip in a zoom mode. So measurement should be at the leaflet tip, the shortest opening, and include commissures when they are split. So here we have to open the commissure and this view the mitral wall area. So optimal gain setting should not be too much. If there is a very marked increase gain setting, it will encroach on the mitral wall. So it will encroach on the mitral wall, and the idea will become less. It should be optimal getting grating, and it should be zoom mode and measurement at the leaflet tip. You see here what we do normally. That will be told to you. It will be difficult to understand theoretically. You go up to the papillary muscles, and from the papillary muscle go to the mitral wall. And you see that this is the mitral wall area. So this is how you measure. That will be also demonstrative. Will be much better to you. What are the limitations? Sometimes there may be everything is not possible to do in an echo. There may be suboptimal imaging in five percent cases. Patient is obese. Patient has got a thick chest wall. Any reason? Respiratory variation. Atrial fibrillation. So there are situations when in about five to seven percent of the cases you are not able to measure the mitral wall area. Then when there is atrial fibrillation, the opening and closing of the mitral wall is very erratic. Sometimes it will open more, sometimes it will open less. So what in this you have to do almost a four or five times a measurement. Now here also in the sinus rhythm also you see whenever you do it if And every time the area will be different, different. So you always take an average in an atrial fibrillation. Do several measurements, but still it can be a, a bit limited limitation. Then lack of technical expertise. So that is why we always tell our our fellows, even in a normal wall, try to calculate mitral wall area. Normal patient. Suppose you have calculated the mitral wall come to 1.6, that means there is something wrong in your calculation. As a day-to-day -day practice, always travel to measure a mitral wall area. Something in which I have not been successful is what is known as a mid diastole. So when I have tried, when there is a difference between a late diastole and mid diastole. So what we do, we take the shortest distance possibly at the tip, shortest shortest area. So that is why these are the these are instrumental setting mean. High gain or a low gain, so that is that. These are three main things we can see, and sometimes there is a heavily calcified wall. You don't know from where to measure, from where to start. So, but these are the three important things in our day-to-day -day practice. And these, so this you can remove. This you cannot do very much, and here you can do several measurements. But then is the pressure half time. Now, now don't go into the theory. The theory will make you very difficult. That time interval in millisecond required by the pressure gradient to declare to half hour will be valid. Remember all this. This I can say at what level the LA and the pressure try to equalize. Now you what happens? You take a snotic orifice. Now the it is snotic orifice. The LA pressure is increased, so it will take a longer time to empty into the ventricles. It will be gradual, so that the gradient will fall slowly, causing prolongation of the time. See, we should remember this. It is the most severe thing for LA to empty into left ventricle because it takes a longer time of LA pressure to equalize with the LV pressure because of the high time. It is prolonged, and hence it is inversely related to the 
wall area the the lesser the wall area the greater will be the la pressure the greater the the greater with the lesser will be the the decision side so what you do is nothing to be done you take a good mitral wall doppler measure you in our rough language i can say mitral the major ef slope but you know here it is a early diastolic opening here it is a deceleration slope when the pressure tends to equalize in between the two and we see the atrial atrium contraction so you only have to measure this and then you get the idea now let us show this we will show you many times also so you take a good mitral wall doppler and you can you trace this slope and it give, will give you the pressure of time automatically the machine give you the time the the wall your top, your aim is to only get you thing now here you see the it was 174 cm so 220 by 174 give you 1.2 cm square so your aim is to get a good doppler envelope a good measurement and you automatically get a, a wall area or so so this is known as a pressure half time and as you see here atrial fibrillation we will tell you how to do how to do it or so so now what are the limitations of pressure half time in day to day practice i will not tell you in what in the rare one but what there are many causes but in our day to day practice the so one is the sinus now you remember we try to measure the ea slope or dc slope but when the heart rate is more than 100 or 110 in sinus tachycardia we don't get slope you cannot measure anything what is the deceleration slope you cannot measure what is what is mitral or so now in these patients you cannot wait for half an hour to give him a tranquilizer you can't wait for a long time longer time to sedate them so that heart rate comes down get him with a busy lab so what we normally do we ask the patient to go and come back we give him about 25 mg of beta blocker in the night not a long acting one and 25 mg about 2 hours before the patient comes into the echo lab so nothing because a short course of 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 beta blocker will not alter our hemodynamic finding so in the night and we tell the patient that not to get stressed and we call about 2 hours before we do the echo so we the patient takes in the night and the patient takes in the morning the 2 hours before he is coming to the echo he sits there so that his heart rate is further slow that is calm down so see the same thing now you see then it becomes heart rate too, and you see this is the this is the slope we measure you see so when the heart rate of here you see there is no slope you cannot measure so here you see the heart rate is about 80 and you can measure this is known as a deceleration slope and in m mode it is known ef slope so you see you see almost in both the time it gets the same finding the pressure half time is 122 220 by the pressure half time gives about 1.8 cm square so that our role again as i stress to you is to get a good doppler envelope and automatically you get every time now here if i take readings all the four it will be different it all of them will not show 1.8 some will show 1.7 some will show 2.0 but here just to show you that if you do it carefully it will almost be the same second is atrial fibrillation so what is happening in atrial fibrillation the 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 complexes are very abnormal some of them are very small some of them are very large some of them are and very abnormal and you cannot see the opening but if, if here what we do no no see you cannot measure anything here you cannot measure anything here so what we do in these cases we do a continuous recording go on recording there is bound to be a phase where there is a white diastolic slope so where you cannot mind here also will be different you cannot measure so you go on recording and as soon as you get a a complex with a white with a white diastolic slope immediately freeze it and you see here you see it is come to about 0.5 cm square 428 is the is the pressure of time 220 by 428 is 0.5. So, so that you were sometimes may take a long time. Now here you see, you see we say five. Now here we cannot measure in five. Here we can measure in one or one here. And every time heart rate should always be a little bit almost on the same side. But try to measure again also. 
But to be, from a practical point of view, what we do is go on recording with one with one finger on the pause button. As soon as you see a, a white diastolic slope, immediately press it and here you can do all the measurement, including the peak and mean gradients. So this is known as a pressure half time. The, the narrower the wall, higher the LA pressure, the higher the LA pressure, it takes more time to, to, to go into the left ventricle, apply the pressure. So this is the more time is lost here. As compared, you see here, here it was just, it was quite brisk, 1.8, but here you see it was just 0.5. You see it is how broad it is. So this is a prolongation of this because it takes a longer time for the mitral wall to LA pressure to, to get into the LV and equalize the pressure. Then something, they did, this, this will be very common in day-to-day -day practice. This will be very common in your day-to-day -day practice. This will be very common in your day-to-day -day practice. Now see here. Now this is known as a bimodal slope. It is a rapid down slope and then there is like this. If you measure, now see, if you measure here, it comes to about 2.4 centimeters. So the, we never measure the rapid initial slope. We never measure the initial rapid slope, and but we measure always the mid diastolic slope. You can see the difference. And here you see the same patient when we have, it is wrong. Now see what I am telling, showing you that you see, measuring from here like this, we are showing here now, see, just to show, measuring from here to here, give you 2.4 centimeters square. But when we measure the mid diastolic slope, it's come to hardly 1.4 centimeters square. So what we do in these cases, we take from here and then go back. We don't measure here, we go back from here. So what we have done, now we have, you see this, we, this is for, only for showing you you see this, and here you see we have gone like this. We have gone all, almost like this, and it comes to 1.4. So never measure the, the initial brisk down slope. Always go from the mid diastolic slope and go back. So that will give you a more correct, correct this. Now, this is difficult. I will tell you this is the aortic wall. This is the aortic regurgitation. Now, now, what happens now? As I told you, how quickly the pressure equalizes between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Now, see, here what happens, the left ventricle, now see, this is a pressure of time. This is the LA, this is LV. Now, the pressure of time is 220 by pressure of time by the area. Now, see, the LA gets filled up by two sources. One is through the mitral wall from the LA. And second is from the AR, from the aorta. So the, the end diastolic pressure of the left ventricle increases. So it comes here, rather than here. So when it comes here, the, the PST shortened. From here to here, now the PL, PST will be from, to, from here to here. So your area will be increased also because if the patient outcome is instead of 190, it is about 80, it becomes increased. In what? Remember that in, in a you know, regurgitation, you always take a planimeter, a, a mitral area, which is not affected by any hemodynamics. Anything which brings these two together. So once you see here, it takes a longer time for the LA-LV pressure to increase. You be right. Now, if the LV comes here, it is shorter time. So when the PST is shortened, the mitral area will increase. So you always use a, this. Then or rate, in one thing, I will tell you, in a, in a only one thing, in a those patients who got a balloon while what we only one thing I remember, you only measure the mitral wall area and you may, don't measure the gradient. Because the gradient will give you a different figure. And just for 48 to 72 hours, then you can measure the gradient. Otherwise, area is the only thing you can give. Because sometimes what happens with intervention cardiologists. They have done a balloon by lot me. They send the patient to in the evening to see what is the, the effect. Don't do a pressure half time. Do a mitral wall area. If you cannot do it, a pressure half time, then you can go to that also. 
then there are some other things of which we need not bother or so. So remember, this is how you measure a, a, this thing. So this is an impaired diastolic relaxation. And in, in an impaired, when you, when you are told the diastolic function, you'll find that this deceleration time is prolonged. And you see, it gives a mitral area of 1.70 centimeters. We call it pseudo MS. So because there is no doming, there is no restriction of movement, walls are not taken. So this is one thing you remember that we will told to you. So, so you see the the uh, the severity of the mitral stenosis has changed after post 2014. Earlier we used to give a mitral wall area, and then importance was given to the gradients also. So that one the area more than 1.5 were lower as mild. 1 to 1.5 moderate and less than 1 it was severe. And similarly, as I told you, the, as the wall goes on narrowing, the gradients goes on increasing because they have to push a blood through a narrowed orifice and this is a pulmonary artery pressure. But post 2014, they made an ACCHA criteria that a severe mitral wall was less than 15, 1.5 centimeters square associated with symptoms. This was used to be a moderate. Very severe is now 1.0 centimeters. That is there. So now the, the problem came when we started using this criteria. So when we, when we suppose the patient was having 1.2, 1.3 centimeters, so that will fall into moderate. Here it will fall into severe. So then we used to write a severe mitral stenosis as per ACC AHA criteria 2014. Because this may not be known very much. Tomorrow they'll say that how since when 1.3 centimeters have become severe. So they're always right that it has per ACCHA criteria. And you can also go into the into the ACCHA criteria or mitral wall uh, or any valvular lesions, and you'll get all the detailed information. So you see the so you see this, and in the in the you see in the all you see in a post 2014. They have not given any importance to the gradient. They have only written mitral wall area. They have not, because when you see the stages of mitral wall, they have given mostly the area. So that is why you should practice at giving the area. But previously, we used to give a, a, a value of this also. So this is according to the 2014. So these are some of the things which anything which obstructs the mitral wall will produce a gradient, which we don't know. This is sort of a a membrane into the left atrium, and this is both is both narrowing at the mitral wall and at the membrane into the called triatriatum or so. So the mean gradient to know how to measure, you have to be parallel to the flow, have a good Doppler. You can use a, a if the wall is you can either use a, a pulse or a a, a CW, but probably do the CW, you see. What we do, you take an apical four chamber view, put a color on, and put a, put a color on, and then you put a, a, a Doppler, and you planimeter it, and you planimeter it, you get always the peak and mean gradients and the VTI. So, so that is how you take, you see, here the peak velocity is this, the peak gradient is this, and the mean gradient is this much. So that is the thing. I'll, so so now, what are the steps? This is this is incidentally for you. What are the steps for Doppler study of mitral wall? That is, we have made it or so. Obtain a, number one. Do most of the studies in apical wall view because you are parallel to the blood flow, going to all the transducer. Obtain maximum velocity. How? By getting good Doppler. You can get in four chambers. You can get in three chambers. So obtain a maximum velocity and don't use the Paris log XLU and get that is the maximum velocity. Obtain mean gradient and TVI again. How? By planimetering it. What you after you have gone planimeter it. Determine MB or if it's area by pressure half time. So here you have taken the Doppler. This is, we are talking of only the Doppler study of MO, not to the and you take a pressure half time. If need be, you take a continuous equation method. And determine PA pressure. How the multiple methods we need not go into detail, either go by TRZ or by PRZ or anything. So these five steps will give you 
a complete peak gradient, mean gradient, mitral wall area by PST, and a PDPA pressure of this. Only remember one thing, that once you are calculating a PA pressure, the IVC don't go toward the IVC side, or toward the RA side, you see, as, as this IVC goes toward the RA size, it is larger in size and it shows a decreased systolic thickening. If you have measured by mistake a, a IVC here, you'll find an increase in the IVC and then you will find a decreased collapse. Always measure near about the, the hepatic vein. So you can see here the IVC is normal size, shows a good collapse, here it is high, it could go show the exit. And whenever you measure the IVC, always repeat it after a sniff. So because they, this, this will be told to you, I must have been taught to you that always measure after a sniff rather than getting only on these two. And try to give a report in a mean PA pressure, which is 0.6 into peak pressure plus two, it gives you the mean PA pressure. And the normal definition of the mean PA pressure is more than 20 mmHg. So you take this, in any case, you take a systolic BP, systolic pressure, Suppose it is 80, so 0. 0.6 into 80, because 48 at plus 2, it becomes 50 is your mean pressure. So these are one or two points upon pH. Now sometimes the problem, because this, this is the largest amount of LA we have seen. This was about 110 millimeters. So this sometimes produces the problems which we show you relatively, you will get some sort of a problem in these cases. You don't know from where to measure all these things. So these are the ones. Why waste time? I always see why waste time. Whenever I now you see this is a parastunnel long axis view. This is the mitral wall. Huge big LA. Severe MR. Now, I never take a, a pressure of time. I never take a gradient. I never take a mitral wall area. Because the only treatment is wall replacement. So why waste time? And I always write, in view of a severe MR, there was the calculation of the MV area and the gradients are invalid. You measure PA pressure and everything. But you see, the, the severe MR, AR, where you see, wherever you see the LA, you will see the MR also. So you see, so why waste time? It is very easy if a patient gets a, we get a more deadly severe MR, we forget everything. This is just to show that wherever you get a, this, you see, this is the LA again. Now, this is the, this is the short axis view, aorta, this is LA. So, in any view where you see the LA, you'll see a severe MR. At least I don't, so many persons may not agree, but because the only treatment is, is wall replacement, there's no point in giving a, a wall area gradient, commissures also because the treatment is different. Now, some, some common complication, which we have, we have told you sometimes. Now, now, this is known as a spontaneous contrast echo. This is whenever there is an atrial fibrillation or there is a low flow state, then the ultrasound beam, when it slides, you see, boom. You yeah, see, <laughs> this is like a dense smoke. The that is all for all of us. It was very rare to see a quality spot there and just go. You see, this is the this is because of the very low flow state, especially the atrial fibrillation, the ultrasound beam produces a spontaneous contrast echo. I'll show you. 